Okay, fellows, let's talk about corporate actions for stocks, bonds, and derivatives. You know, there, there are some people talking about similar subjects. Uh, some of them know something, but some of them are not experts at all. I just want to say a little bit about myself. Um, I have a strong financial background from New York and London. Um, one of my jobs involved working as a head of corporate actions for Deutsche Bank. So I know this topic very well. I also have academic training in finance. Currently, uh, I'm, I'm working on my dissertation, doctoral dissertation in finance. So basically the, uh, the information you will get from me is reliable and trustworthy. And this presentation will take a form of a lecture. I will not put some fancy sound or graphical effects, but you will learn what you need to know about corporate actions and it will be valid. So, so what are corporate actions? First of all, as an investor, you will be exposed to various corporate actions, whether you want it or not. To be a well-informed investor, an educated investor, you need, you need to understand how these affect your investments. Basically, the corporate actions are divided into two broad kinds, mandatory and vol voluntary. Mandatory means they will happen anyway. Sometimes you have an option to choose one of those, but they will happen anyway. And voluntary means that you can opt out. In addition, you know, there are corporate actions for equities, fixed income products, such as uh, bonds, and derivatives, such as coal and put options. So let's talk about mandatory corporate actions for equities. Another name for equities is stocks. So mandatory means it will happen anyway. Now let's take a look at the first corporate action, a cash dividend. You cannot say you don't want a cash dividend. You either it's a mandatory event because it was declared by the board of directors. Um, and it's a good thing to get a cash dividend. So, but you can, you, this is a kind of a mandatory option where you can have a choice. Like you can get the cash dividend or ask to have that dividend to be reinvested, you know, into stocks. There are like, sometimes you get an option to reinvest your dividends. But anyway, how, how does the cash dividend works? In the United States, dividend paying companies basically pay dividends every quarter. So, um, and of course, there are lots of companies that don't pay dividends. But basically what happens is that there's a declaration date when the board of directors declares a di dividend. They have to declare it every time it's not required for a company by, by the law to pay a dividend, at least not in the United States, but, but still, like, you know, the board of directors wants to declare it. So let's say they declared a dividend on March 1st. So you can take a look here. Say so they declared it on March 1st, but you will not get paid until April 15th. But what happens in between? On April 5th, uh, the stock goes ex-dividend. This is the ex-dividend date. That means the stock opens lower, adjusted for the price of the dividend. So if the stock closed, let's say at $10, and the dividend is 50 cents, the stock will open at 950, more or less, plus, because there's also supply and demand, but the, the price of the stock will be adjusted for the dividend so you know the people just don't buy it 
for the dividend and sell it later. Then there's a record date, April 7th. As long as you had the stock in your possession on April 7th, the record date, you will get paid on April 15th. What happens if you sell the stock on April 10th? You still will get paid on the 15th because you had um, the stock on the record date. Now, for stocks to settle, it takes three days. So, April, so if so, to have a stock on the record date of the 7th, you need to buy that stock on April 4th. And let's assume these are regular business days. We're talking about business days. So this is Monday, let's say this is Monday and this is Thursday. So there are three days for the, for the settlement. So you have to buy it before the ex-dividend date. So April 4th, right? If you would buy, buy, buy that on the, the ex-dividend date, the transaction would settle on April 8th and you wouldn't get the dividend. But anyway, this is how cash dividend works. So the X dividend date is usually a couple of trading days before the stock dividend record date, three days at least, for the settlement to take place. So based on the record date, companies know who gets the declared dividends. So on, on the X dividend date, the dividend's value is dropped from the price of a stock. If the stock is bought on this day or after, no dividend will be paid because the standard settlement takes three days. So this is a quote from the Educated Investors Handbook, Volume 1, What You Need to Know First. Uh, in this handbook you get lots of information like this plus uh, information about investment strategies and how financial products work and so on, a lot of useful information. But let's continue. Stock splits, mandatory events. You, you cannot do anything about that. Now, regular stock split, these don't, you have to remember, they don't increase the intrinsic value of a company, but investors still like them. So if, for example, there's a three for one split. For every share, the investor will get three shares. So let's say you had 100 shares in 90, at $90. After three uh, for one split, you will get 300 shares for $30. So nothing will change. You will have more shares, but at, at one third of the price. The companies lower uh, the, to the two splits to lower the price of a stock to attract more investors. And when the you know price is lower, it looks to some that the stock you know is kind of cheaper. I mean, it's not because the market cap didn't change, but often, which is not so rational, but often the price of the stock will rise after a regular stock split. It also indicates that the company is succeeding, that it's raising its price, so it's a positive signal. Now, the opposite is the reverse stock split. It's usually bad news. So there are also reverse stock splits, such as one for 10. Here, for 10 shares, the investor gets only one, while the stock price increases tenfold. If there are fractional shares, investors get cash for them. So if an investor holds 11 shares, this would represent 1.1 new shares. In that case, cash would be paid for a fraction of 0.1 of a share. Generally, it's important to note, companies do reverse splits when the stock pr uh, price drops below $1. This is done often to maintain a NASDAQ listing. listing. Because if a company is trading uh, under $1 for a long time, it may be delisted. Many, 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 many penny stock companies do it. Uh, the problem with, with, with penny stock companies is that they keep on issuing new shares, diluting the ownership, 
the stock price drops to a fraction of a share, some, to a fraction of a cent sometimes. Then they do a thousand for one reverse split, so the stock is worth two dollars. Then they keep on <laughs> diluting and diluting the the price drops again to cents, and they do another reverse split. You should actually, if you if you're looking at low cap stocks, you should check to, to see if they had any reverse splits and if they continue to issue equity. Because if they do that, you will just lose by holding it. Unless you want to speculate uh, like on a day trade, but it's still a risky game. These are usually garbage companies that do reverse splits. Usually, I'm not saying all, but 95% of the time, bad news. So reverse stock splits are generally badly received by investors as they indicate that the company isn't doing well and doesn't expect it, its stock price to rise. Now, stock dividends. Some companies reward the shareholders with stock dividends. Technically, when shareholders receive extra shares, it doesn't create any value as most shares are, are, are outstanding and the stock price drops. But generally, investors feel richer, and if the company is doing well, they end up with more valuable shares. But at the moment, the stock dividend is declared, you're not getting any richer. An example of a stock dividend is, let's say there's a 10% stock dividend. So investor who has 100 shares will get 10 extra shares. And you also, you have to own them on the record date. So the trade has to be fully settled. So that's a stock dividend. A lot of information you can find in uh, the Educated Investors Handbook, uh, the first volume called What You Need to Know First. It talks about lots of things the beginner investors should know. Also, some investors have knowledge gaps. That's where you can fill some of those knowledge gaps. And the book covers, uh, it costs only a few dollars. It covers uh, investment products, investment accounts, ways to invest globally, uh, finance principles, as well as trading and investing rules based on the world's best investors and traders. So this is a concise book that where, where you can learn a lot. Uh, packed with information. Another mandatory corporate action is a stock spin-off. It doesn't, doesn't happen that often, but it, it happens sometimes. Companies may decide to spin off one of their divisions. So in such cases, shareholders can get the shares of a new company and still hold the shares of the old company. Uh, technically, the shares they ori originally had lost value as spin-off makes the original company less valuable because they got rid of a division that's, that's a separate company now. But it is replaced in value arising from the issuance of new shares. So you, you also have new shares. So you have your old shares plus new, sh new shares of a new entity. A major reason for a spin-off is to unlock the, the value of a division that's being spun off. So corporate strategists decided that if that division is separate, they will do better. Generally, this is perceived as a positive development by the shareholders. So often there's a gain, that means the value of the old and new shares should be higher than the value of before the spin-off. But there, there are no rules, it all depends. But generally, it is a positive event. Unless the company spins off a belly doing division with lots of debt. But that's also, you know, to manage uh, issues. Mergers and acquisitions. When a merger happens, two companies combine to form a single company. 
So often, stacks and A and B will be combined into stack C. When an acquisition happens, one company buys the other. If the other company is also publicly listed, the shareholders of the acquired company get shares of the buying company, although in some situations they get cash. Sometimes, when an acquisition happens, the shares of a buyer drop while the shares of the seller rise, especially if a price paid for the target was well above its market price. Liquidating dividends. Uh, these dividends are uncommon, very un uncommon. Usually when a company decides to close operations, like go out of business, not go bankrupt, but go out of business, it will return capital to shareholders. On the other, uh, on the other hand, a company that intends to operate will sell one of its divisions or some assets and then distribute cash to its shareholders. Now let's talk about voluntary corporate actions for equities. With voluntary corporate actions, investors or their portfolio managers need to decide which option to choose. Depending on corporate action, not choosing to respond can result in a default option being automatically selected or in nothing happening, as with some tender offers. Uh, when a tender offer is made to investors, the price offered is normally somehow above the current market price. For example, if shares of a company trade at $8, a tender can be made at $9 in order to motivate investors to, to give up the shares. There are various reasons for a tender. Some tender offers are made by companies to their shareholders as part of a share buyback program. Here, companies use excess cash to buy back some of their own shares. Sometimes, tender offers are made by hostile investor looking to take over a company. Now, let's talk about Dutch auctions. In a Dutch auction, there's a limited number of shares to be bought, and those willing to sell, sell the shares submit their offers, so willing to sell, so it's a voluntary, right? At first, the lowest offer offers to sell get the shares allocated to buyers, then remaining shares are allocate, allocated to higher offers to sell until all the shares have been allocated to buyers, from sellers to buyers, right? So every allocator, allocated bidder gets shares at the same price, which is the lowest sell price at which the less shares are allocated. See, so you will get, everyone will get the same price. Due to uncertainties as to the final price, because you don't know, Dutch auctions come with price limits. For, for instance, a buyer may specify the highest price he or she is willing to pay. If you have to pay more, then you will not buy anything. But you can end up paying less. That's a Dutch auction. Now, voluntary exchange corporate action. This is not common, but it can happen. Voluntary exchange is also known as optional conversion. It is an offer to shareholders or to bondholders to exchange one, one type of security for another. For example, stocks can be exchanged for some other financial instruments, such as bonds or cash. Rights auctions and rights issues. During rights auction, the rights to purchase new shares are offered to the highest bidders. So a right is actually an option to buy something at a certain price. But in this case, you buy a right, not the share. Once you buy a right, then you can buy the share. So in a rights issue, existing shareholders of record are offered the rights to buy additional shares at a fixed price. Often this happens during secondary offerings. So existing shareholders can maintain their percentage, percentage stakes of the company's ownership. 
Typically, the rights of a publicly listed company can be sold in the market before their expiration. So once you get those rights, if you don't exercise them to buy shares, you can still sell them in the market to others. So they kind of trade like options in a sense. Uh, subscri subscription offers. During a subscription offer, the existing shareholders or bank holders are given an option to subscribe to, to a new issue at a predetermined price. So you can say, we're offering new, new additional shares. You can buy, it, uh, buy them at such a price if you want to. If you don't, it's a voluntary. Right? But if you want to buy them, you have to indicate that you have to buy them. That you want to buy them, and then you need to have money to buy them. So common shareholders have shares that entitle them to voting. So the more shares you have, the more votes you have. So, uh, they, so this way they can participate in, pl in proxy voting. So this includes voting for the board of directors, approving or disapproving management's proposals, as well as other critical issues. So if there's an annual meeting, shareholders can actually attend it or vote remotely or via their broker. Brokerage houses uh, often in inform the clients about such events or you need to monitor. You know, you can call investor relations of your company to find out when such meetings happen and you should be informed that this uh, vote going on. When it comes to mutual funds, portfolio managers get to vote on behalf of the clients. So um, such custodian rights give large institutional investors some leverage over companies. But like if you're an individual investor, you don't have to physically attend a meeting to vote. You can vote by mail or by internet now. So uh, that's called proxy voting. But you know, like the last sentence, let me go back to it. It says, such custodian rights give large institutional investors some leverage over companies. So let's say some mutual fund family owns a million shares of ABC company, and that's 10 or 20% of the, of the shares outstanding or the float. They have a lot of influence when it comes to voting. Uh, they can choose uh, directors, so they have leverage over companies. Now, let's go into fixed income corporate actions. When it comes to corporate actions for fixed income products, such as bonds, there are also mandatory and voluntary events. The mandatory corporate actions for bonds, so they will happen anyway. So interest uh, payments are among the most common ones. In the United States, bonds typically have semi-annual interest payments based on fixed coupon rates. So for example, if a coupon is 6% of par value and par of 100 represents $1,000, then there will be two semi-annual payments in a given year of $30 each. So you will get $60 every year for every $1,000 bond you have. Final redemption is another mandatory corporate action. It's when at bond, bond's maturity, the principal is returned to investors. Typically, the principal amount is 1,000, but it can differ for some issues. At times, convertible bonds get converted into stocks. This can happen at the choosing of a company, so it's a mandatory event, or at the option of investors, a voluntary event. Now, let's talk about voluntary corporate actions for bonds. If there's a tender offer for bonds, investors can offer their bonds in return for cash. Let's say bonds were issued at $1,000, but the current value in the market is 920. This can happen if interest rates went up significantly and or, or when the credit rating deteriorated. In such, in such situations, a buyer <clears throat> which could be the issuer or someone else, such as a fund buying distressed securities, offers to buy bonds. To encourage sellers, a price above the current market price could be offered. 
So if a bond is trading at 920, you can sell it now to them at 940, for example. Another voluntary corporate action would be an exchange offer where bond holders are offered to exchange their bonds for some other security, such as a stock of the issuer. Now, let's talk about corporate actions for derivatives. A derivative, something whose value is based on underlying instrument, such as call option on a stock, or futures contract on oil, for example. Uh, stock splits and option contracts. When it comes to American options, a standard option contract on a stack represents 100 shares, right? One contract, 100 shares. What, what if there's a stack split? You know, if there's a stack split, the contract gets adjusted. For instance, if there's an option for 100 shares of a company XYZ at 20 strike price, and there's a two for one stack split, the, the, stock, the strike price will be changed to 10, and there will be two contracts instead of one. Now, what if there's a three for one stock split? Each contract will represent 150 shares. So you will not have more contracts, but each contract will rep represent 150 shares, and the stock price will be adjusted by one third. From, so it, uh, the strike price was 20, now it will be 13.33. Uh, calls and puts and bonds. Uh, there are also options and bonds. Calls allow the issuer to redeem the options prior to maturity at a specified price by a specified date, while puts allow the bondholders to sell their bonds to the issuer also at a specified price uh, prior to a specified date. So if a, if a company exercises a call, it is a mandatory action. Mm -hmm. However, most of the time, majority of situations. However, put exercises are up to bondholders. Therefore, they are generally considered to be voluntary actions. Mm -hmm. So company owes a call and you own a put. Of course, not every bond comes uh, with attached calls or puts, only some of them do. But anyway, corporate actions related to warrants. Stack warrants can also be considered as options. The corporate actions related to warrants issue include warrant uh, issues, exercises, and expiries. Companies issue warrants for various reasons, such as ra raising additional capital, when a warrant is issued and exercised into shares at a set price. Warrants also have exercise prices and expiration dates. If, for example, warrants can be exercised at $20 for a share of a stock and the stock trades at $30, then the warrants are in the money and can be exercised, traded in the market, or held in expectations that the stock price will rise further to their expiration date. If warrants are out of the money, the exercise price is higher than the stock price. Then they are likely to expire worthless. Out of the money warrants can also be sold in the market to other investors, but their value will be limited to their time value, which is time left to expiration during which there's a possibility that the stock price will rise. I hope I, ex I explained those corporate actions well. If you still find them confusing, uh, please, please refer to the Educated Investors Handbook. And I would like to thank you for your time. Uh, please subscribe for more. There will be more videos. And if you think, you know, my work has some value, please give me a like. Okay, and here, here's a disclaimer. This video provides investment education and does not constitute investment advice. Although it was meticulously researched, the author does not provide any guarantees and assumes no, no responsibility for investment actions of the readers.